Okay, so I suggest we, we start. Okay. That's our real pleasure um, to finish this uh, whole uh, RL, evolutionary RL and applications of RL to robotics day uh, with uh, Professor Dongvi Lee. So Dongvi is an associate professor of human-centered assistive robotics at the Technical University of Munich within the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And she's also director of a human-centered assistive robotics group at the German Aerospace Center. Uh, her research interests include human motion understanding, human-robot interaction, machine learning in robotics, and assistive robotics. So that's our real pleasure to have you uh, today, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. OK, so thank you very much for your kind introduction and also invitation. It is my pleasure to give a talk at this uh, the reinforcement learning school. So today, I will provide uh, my perspective and also some of the recent research activities on the robots, motor skill learnings, basically. So my talk has uh, four parts. First one is about the learning from demonstrations and reinforcement learning in robotics. And I will uh, increase the complexity of the task, what the robot has to learn. So human-robot interaction and some complex manipulation tasks. So let's uh, start with the first part. So learning from the demonstration and imitation learning. So the imitation learning is also called in robotics, learning from the demonstration. And what is the imitation learning? Imitation as a basic concept of the imitation as we mirroring myself to the other and also others to myself. And this is a very interesting uh, research topic for the multiple disciplines like development learning and neuroscience and optimal control and also psychology, human acceptance and so on. And especially in robotics, why imitation learning is, has been received a lot of attention is that because it allows the novice uh, users to program complicated uh, robotic system, complicated system like robots. And also, I believe this is a very efficient way to learn motor skills. And that's why also humans also using this imitation. Imitation is an interesting motivation for us to learn very efficiently. And in many different robotics lab, using this imitation learning approaches in a different machine learning tools, using different machine learning tools and implementing it. But one of the basic uh, still common thing is we learn from the human motions. And this once it is learned, the movement primitives are learned that it can be used for the recognizing others activities and also generating my own uh, actions. And especially in robotics, imitation learning is not only about the generating the what has been seen movement is a lot about the generalization to the different situation. Like uh, if it is about the reaching movement primitives, then the reaching, the learned movement primitives should be able to generalize to a different goal or different intermediate goal. And also grasping some object then it should be able to generalize it to the different sizes of the objects and no time cases or the different initial configuration of the threads are needed. And so the using this learning from the humans demonstration, others demonstration, we often use it also in the humans, right? When we learn the new sports, we do maybe such things like uh, imitating teacher's behavior or teacher corrects the student's poses. And sometimes the human uses some special tool to make uh, uh, motions of the marionettes. And in robotics cases, we also use a very similar 
teach modalities to teach robots behavior, like robot is imitating humans whole body motion or correcting in kinesthetic teaching or using the teleoperation system to teach the robots far away. And they are very similar, shares similarities. And also one hand, what you see here, the most left hand side, if we're using the one imitates others motion, it is very intuitive for the teacher's perspective because I know that task and I just have to do show it basically. And on the other hand, whenever we need to use some special tools like uh, uh, teleoperation systems, it usually uh, increases the human's cognition, cognitive burdens. On the other hand, the most left side, these two agents shares only the extraceptive sensory data, but teleoperation systems and so on, that we could also sense what the robot senses, like a false information. So we could even teach correct false information to the robot. I will start to talk about the first part, human motion imitation, basically by the humanoid robot. We have been working a lot about this uh, human motion retargeting to the different robotic systems, also human hand to the robotic hand. And also, as you can see here in this video, we told the different humanoid robots. Humanoid robot can imitate the human's upper body motions, including torso, or this small humanoid robot now can imitate also fit pose and orientation and also humans as center of mass or center of pressure between the foot and the ground. And in this case also it can imitate not only the Cartesian pose of the some end effectors body parts, but also it imitates uh, like joint angles like knee angles here. So the humanoid robot total can imitate the humans and knee stretched walking as well. So I will not gonna go into the details of this, how retargeting really works, but uh, I will just uh, give you more high level concepts and what kind of problems are existing in robotic learning. So we have this imitation algorithms that allows to make a robot to learn very efficiently and quickly some motions. And in this case, I tried to teach a uh, robot, Justin. Okay, I don't know why it's so shaking actually today. The videos are the now. So I showed this kind of a perfection dance motions to the robot, and robot is imitated. And then you can see that robot's hand pose hand height was higher than my expectation, what I wanted. So we use this now here, the refining concepts, like re refining some poses of the student. So first we did the human motion capturing and that motion has been retargeted to the, like in this case, the Justin robot. And then it has been learned using here was a hidden markup models and then generated. And then when it is needed, uh, so the trajectory comes in and we learned some model parameters and then we generate basically using the, some regression techniques here. And then these uh, trajectories and also these uh, variances goes into the controller and then here impedance controller. And then when human is required to correcting it, it allows the physical interaction by having compliance here in this controller. So this is the result of the imitation learning. As you can see, it is higher than what I wanted. I wanted to have the hand was height of the uh, robot eye as well, but due to the differences in the kinematics and dynamics between human and robot, resulting imitation retargeting was not perfect. So I just went in and then just to show the another demonstrations. And then this demonstration goes into the incremental learning. 
And now the robot Justin has learned also this behavior very quickly. So you can see that teaching this the it's still high dimensional movements, but in a very few demonstrations, with a, only a few demonstrations, we could teach the robots how to do it. And here it is the using the teleoperation systems to teach some kind of a grasping tasks. Here you shouldn't squeeze it too much and so on. So we have to show, we have now here is a bilateral uh, teleoperation systems so human can feel the, what robot feels. And then using this information, robot has been learned also correct uh, force profiles as well as the position information, movement information. So using the teleoperation allows another level of uh, teaching, another level of uh, we shared another sensory modality, so proprioceptive sensors, and we could even teach that. However, there are some challenges also in the teleoperation, although teleoperation is a great technique for the teaching the robots far away or like a surgical robot or underwater robot or space robot, but usually it requires quite a lot of time to get familiarized with such systems. And also even look at this simple packing hole task, like we just ask a robot to pack in hole, you know, these the four holes. And then if we show this kind of demonstration using the kinesthetic teaching and teleoperation system, we see quite different quality of the demonstrations. So kinesthetic teaching is more consistent in terms of special and temporal variations, but also teleoperation has higher variety and also often this, even this simple task the operator couldn't finish it from the beginning to the end. So often what we have is very incomplete data and uh, how can we use this uh, low, relatively low quality of the demonstration data for the teaching the robot. So I'm not gonna go into the very details of this approaches, but nevertheless, the main concept is this. So we teach the robots these behaviors using the DMP dynamic movement primitives and also Gaussian mixture models. So we have uh, two basically dynamical systems here. One is showing basically canonical systems and the second one is just a second order, not uh, the linear dynamical system with here not linear form terms here forcing term and this forcing term has been encoded using the Gaussian mixture models. And here, since the, 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 the data are often incomplete, so what we did is we just make some kind of completely unknown variable entered. And then we try to estimate not only the Gaussian mixture models, the data, so using the expectation maximization algorithm, but also we try to estimate this unknown phase parameter so that the, 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 the demonstrations are automatically aligned during the EM procedure. So the data, unsynchronized data comes in, and then the, during the learning, it is automatically synchronized. And then after learning, robot can execute this uh, packing hole tasks. Of course, uh, using this uh, teleoperation data, robot can learn now how to do this task autonomously. But also, often it is very good to have some shared co shared control concepts because of the some unknown situations and so on. So for example, in the left hand side, a video you see now the learned artificial agent controls the horizon movement and only the human controls only vertical motions. And here as you can see, it has been learned this uh, four horse packing or tasks. Now, all the sudden environment has been changed. So here is great things about the shared control. Human is just automatically adapts only that part. And then, you know, it goes in and then this data goes into the on the fly learning. And then robot is now has been learned this uh, small changes in the environment. And then it's now doesn't try to go into the, these uh, situations. So system learns on the fly. I think that is a very important aspect. 
So I just explained very shortly about the, some techniques about the robot learning from the human demonstrations. And now I will go into the more reinforcement learning uh, approaches here. So reinforcement learning in robotics is also preferable because robot can learn how to execute a task by interacting in the environment themselves, right, itself. And when, especially when human doesn't, cannot really provide correct answer solutions to solve this problem. So this is especially true for the highly dynamic tasks, how to flip the pancakes or very dynamic maneuver of the helicopters upside down and so on. These are very hard to provide the correct, really control answers to that. And then often it doesn't require, of course, the exact model of the robots and also environment. But however, also we have very typical problems of the reinforcement learning in the robotic domains. Usually robotics system has a very high dimensional state action space and also is continuous. So often humanoid robots can have 50 degrees of freedom is easy to have and hand also. So this dimensionality problem is very hard and then how to make the reinforcement learning to be learned efficiently. And also the rollouts in real world are very, very expensive in the robotics. And the sensor data are also very um, noisy as well. So it is very expensive to do the many rollout in the real world. And also exploration with the real robot is very dangerous usually. So it can easily damage the robotics hardwares. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, in fact, there are a lot of uh, approaches to deal with uh, such challenges, well-known challenges in the applying the reinforcement learning to the robotics. And one of the approach is actually using the imitation learning combined with the reinforcement learning here. Uh, as a one approach, it is about uh, one approach is inverse reinforcement learning. So usually we get the human demonstrations. And in this case, we map the human hand to the robotic hand. Uh, and then we try to find it out also this uh, reward function basically without having the manual tuning or designing of the reward tuning. Sometimes it is hard to also know the what is really reward of the doing some uh, in-hand manipulations and so on. So this kind of thing could be used as well. And another approach often people use it as imitation learning as the first initial policy for the reinforcement learning. This method is from the Jens Kofer's work, Power Algorithm. And it is a very efficient algorithm and they have uh, basically, you know, weighted their uh, exploration using the, some weighted uh, rewards from the past. And it, they do not have any knowledge about the models of model free approaches. And then human demonstration is used as the initial policy. And then this uh, relatively difficult task put in a cup can be learned after about 100 trials here, 60 trials, 100 trials, then robot could be able to uh, learn this uh, uh, fairly co complicated dynamic tasks. And a lot of work goes on to the how to efficiently learn with a relatively low number of uh, real rollouts. I believe probably today, uh, previous lecture was about these uh, approaches. And then I believe uh, the, this, the survey of this work has been presented already. So I will not gonna go into the, a lot into the details here, but one of the approach in that direction is of course a peer core algorithm from the Dyson North basically. So here as they used some model-based policy search algorithms, but the main key of this approach is using the simulations actually. Uh, 
to do the finding of some optimal policy and then do the small number of the real rollout with the, using the real robot. And then from this robot, and then we learn the, some robot dynamics models using the Gaussian processes. And the learned model is used for the in the simulation, again, finding the policies. And then this loop is going on. A lot of things happening in the simulation. So real rollout has been dramatically really reduced. Here is a very well-known carport uh, swinging up tasks. And then you can here see that how many real uh, rollout is happening and then how many seconds of the interaction is really needed in the real world. So it requires only maybe six, seven triers and then only requires about the 17 seconds of the uh, real environment experience is enough to learn this car course swinging up tasks. Here is you can see required the interaction time in the real world has been dramatically reduced in the peer core. So peer core algorithm is very actually great algorithm. And then this model only provide actually the confidences in the space, the state space where the robot has been visited basically. So the, sometimes it can be still dangerous for the robotic systems, when especially when it is in the state where it never has been seen and then this uh, random behavior or exploration behavior can easily damage the robot. So for the robotics perspective, it is much safer to start with uh, some approximate models and then only learn something really hard to modeling about like a joint friction or contact forces and so on. And similarly, we did a lot of uh, learning uh, find, finding policy in the simulation and then only updating residual dynamics using the real robot and then this approximate model and then residual model is used for the finding the policy. In this way, the even the real rollout has been much reduced and then real experiences in the real world has been reduced. Here in this case, similar again, car for swing attack, but we added uh, some very unknown uh, springs in between the world and then the robot. And this makes it, of course, uh, hard to learn. Um, but you can also see that this algorithm, if you have already some good starting point, the learning is even much faster, which is in some sense obvious. So it, as I said many, many times in the robotic system, when we're dealing with a very complicated and expensive hardware, like a human-sized humanoid robot, we couldn't just make a robot to random exploring the policies, actually. So this is a very important aspect. And then also uh, during this uh, reinforcement learning, how to deal with these uh, unsuccessful triers often when it is about the falling of the humanoid robot or when we're dealing with the in-hand manipulation, if robot is something lost it, then again, human has to pick it up and then reset the, again, the starting points and then start the learning. And this uh, intervention, human intervention, needed intervention is uh, very tiring. So it is gonna be much better if we could make uh, reinforcement learning could be work also robust to the irreversible, uh, irreversible event. So we try to minimize this uh, irreversible event by using the good controllers and also using some already existing models. Even that is not perfect, it's just good enough. Then we can have much safer learning actually. So here is an example of the bipedal the walking. And the bipedal walking is usually, mm, yeah, uh, okay. So one of the most famous control algorithm for the bipedal walking is a ZMP based walking algorithm. So zero moment point is the center of pressure basically. And uh, it treats the robot as just inverted pendulum. And just using this a template model, invert the pendulum model, and we try to stabilize the COM basically. That is the concept. And this is a well really used for the many, many 
uh, by Pete Robot in the world. Maybe first algorithm people use it is usually ZNP based working algorithm, and it works well. Um, but however, since it is uh, the real robot is not the really the inverted pendulum model, and then there are always the unmodeled parts of the dynamics are there in the environment as well. So even when we do the ZNP tracking, you, we will always see that something residual errors between the desired ZNP and the real ZNP here. So we do the Gantt here trial and error learning approaches here. So the concept is very simple, actually. So we try to see that now we change the references of the ZMPs now using the difference between the desired ZMP and the real ZMP and then goes in and then we modified now the this ZMP trajectories and this goes into the working pattern generator to generate continuous COM, center of mass, and ZMP trajectories. And then again, the here some controllers to stabilize. So this approach has been applied to the humanoid robot total. And here is basically when the, this learning has been started. And then in the simulation, it only requires a few iteration to converge this already the learning and real experiments, it takes a bit longer. So it takes about, uh, about 10 trials, 10 iteration walking patterns period to learn the, this uh, bit much stable uh, walking. And then here you can see the ZMP error has been reduced from the about three centimeters to the 1.4 centimeters. And then this robot's fit is actually, the width is about uh, 9.5 centimeters or something. So three centimeter, more than three centimeter is already quite at edge, edge. And then it can easily tilt it over as well in case of the data a bit of an uneven terrain in the real world. So here is upper case is so with uh, learned ZMP compensation terms and without lower part is without the learned this. And then we just provide a similar perturbation to the robot. And then since uh, this one has the much more stable walking, so it could still walk through. And then the other case is easily uh, flip over basically. And Usually this is a lot about the generalization and that we don't wanna do the, this uh, trial and error uh, learning for the each walking parameters neither. So we only selected a few sets of the straight walking or straight lateral walking or bit circular walking. And then we learned basically what is the needed compensation terms. And then this is saved it as basically some kind of a lookup tables. And then whenever it comes to different walking speed or walking parameters, like uh, different step sizes are needed, then it's automatically uh, generalizable. And then it is not perfect, but you can see the blue is a desired ZMP. And then this green one is uh, using this uh, compensated ZMP lookup tables. And then we could uh, already come up with a much better controller, stable walking controller than before. So which is compared to the red lines. Okay, so I started to talk about the first part about how to learn the movement, primitive simple movements from the human demonstrations. And then we went to the more dynamic task learning, uh, which is hard to really uh, learn by the dynamics and then using the trial and errors. And then we go into the more uh, complex situations now, the task learnings, human robot interactions, let's say. In the human robot interaction, what is the key challenge? Actually, the key challenge is the existence of the human. Human is not a passive entity in the world, right? So we do not really just need to learn about the terrains, the some stiffness values by the reinforcement learning, or it's not about, I try to learn the friction, which I could not model so accurately within the joints of the robot. Human is really active entity, and then it has the full of uncertainty. So dealing with the human and human robot interaction tasks is really challenging things. 
And then here I would like to show you one example about the learning human robot collaboration, like carrying a table. And in this particular set uh, setup, I try to teach the robots how to do the carrying of tables, but robot doesn't know where to go. But human only knows the where it should go. So at the beginning, robot is just following to the human, you know, basically based on the force sensing. Human is pushing that direction, then tries to follow the human forces. And then this information position and orientation, force talk, all this information goes into the incremental learning. And online, on the fly, robot is trying to find out what is the make sense of a uh, segment, basically, those primitives are. And then primitives are learned and incrementally clustering. And then it starts to understand what is going on. And then later on, it starts to predict, OK, I know where human is going now because I haven't seen these things a few times already. And then based on the prediction, robot generates its own motion. And then using this uh, predicted behavior, robot is acting it. So basically, what we try to do, teach the robot is, robot tries to make uh, from the experiences with humans, robot behavior is changing from the passive follower to the active contributor to the these tasks. So this concept has been uh, first tested in the very simple, like a 2D uh, setup. Here, what you see is a first repetition. And then we ask a human and robot, human to make uh, these uh, trajectories. And then you see is one point, basically. I just uploaded a point, which is the robot and table and human, just the, I represented as a one single point. And the current position is in the green. And then now, robot is just passively following. And then this repetition goes on. Now, after seeing three repetition, robot tries to now predict what's gonna be happening. And then you can see predicted one is a bit reddish color and it is always ahead of the current location. And this predicted the, the trajectory is used for the now robot controller. So robot knows where to go in advance. And then so that it doesn't have to be always passively following, but actively simultaneously work together with the humans. And here also uh, the, the human partner just let it go. And then you can see the system still moves. So it can still shows that uh, used uh, predictive behavior is used for the robot controller. So as repetition goes on, you can see the predicting error has been reduced. And also this human force to carry a table has been reduced from the full Newton to the a bit a bit more than two Newton basically or 2.5 neurons. And then even we did the predicting, we didn't use this predicting result for the robot controller. Then again, human force goes back to the almost original level. So you could completely see that uh, this uh, prediction is uh, helping for the assist, uh, you know, helping the human robot collaborations. Actually, so what we saw was, okay, this uh, prediction works well, but the still human not gonna go exactly the same trajectory as the robot predicted. So we wanted to use this uh, uncomfortable maybe feeling, maybe a bit of a difference between the human's view position and then pr robots predict the locations. So how to deal with this? So we try to learn also the human's models, right? Not only the this weird kind of go, and also we try to use these variances. So we learned these motions, basically the trajectories and also the variances, and also some fighting forces between the human and robot. So basically some this disagreement between human and robot is also learned with the mean and also covariance matrices. And then robot is trying to follow as much as this predicted, the predicted uh, trajectories using the stochastic optimal control. But here we used also this uh, uh, covariance, inverse of the covariance, so that we can make robot to behave 
okay, if there is high variance, this robot doesn't need to really push too much to the raw human to go into the exact dislocation. So we try to make the gain is a bit lower and the raw variance is the area that the, you know, the robot is becoming more pushing. So control gain is increasing. And also same thing when the disturbance is happening between the human and robots, a disagreement happens, robots behavior can be changing. So when there is a disagreement is there that risk seeking robot can just become more passive and risk averse robot is more pushing dominant be behavior, making dominant behaviors. And I will go on to the most last part of the, my talk which is a uh, complex uh, manipulation task learning. <clears throat> uh, in the learning of complex tasks, I believe one of the important thing is the, to find embedded structure of the task from the demonstrations. And we have been develop, uh, investigating what are the different structures are there. And so like a temporal structure or a special structure or a conditioner or hierarchy in the symbolic abstraction. In, in the case of the temporal structure, basically, we know there are a typical transition probability. So after I did this movement, I usually do the other one. So like I pull out my arm, then next one often comes is I bring back my arm. So this kind of uh, learning, this uh, sequencing pr probability is also one of the important things. And another thing is uh, some special, special relation. Like if I wanna reach some object, then the reaching behavior is should be uh, conditioned on this object where you want to reach it to, right? So these are the called also task parameters. And these task parameters are not necessarily only to the objects in the environment. It can be also the special relation is also exists between the skills, like a consecutive skills. So after uh, for the picking behavior, Usually picking behavior is uh, related to the written behavior, previous written behavior. And also the, a lot of complex tasks requires uh, many, many decision-making points. And this decision-making has to be based on the, some conditional reasoning. And then the last point is uh, some difficult, I, I don't know, I mean, the tasks like, uh, making a coffee or making a meal or salad whatsoever, usually they are consist, can be uh, decomposed to the, some subtasks and these subtasks can be decomposed into the some movements basically, move A to B. So I will talk about maybe two examples here. So conditional tasks maybe. Uh, current collaborative robots, and usually they have some interfaces to make a sequence of the some skills, like after pick a plate and place plate and then drill and, and so on. But there are also cases, it just uh, you don't know these uh, sequences and then there can be more branchings, uh, multiple branches can be existing as well. So how do we do this? It's also, it can be, you have to really sense this uh, on the fly, you cannot really tell that in advance before you start these emotions. So here is the example of uh, milk carton sorting. So you can see here is a human demonstration. We give the human demonstration without any labels, basically. So human just shows that, okay, this was the empty butter without the name anything, just going into the here. When it is a full carton, you go to the another uh, sorting locations without any labeling. But robot learns also what is required the force that time the force and also location. So it learns this conditioner uh, probability or this um, mm, the joint probability between the different sensor data and then it executes. 
of course, before starting, you have to know it is the empty butter or full butter. So you just go with it with one of the things. And then as soon as you sense something is uh, wrong, then you switch it to the different location. So here was actually, it thought the robots just started with the full carton, but then as long as, as soon as it touches and lifting, it sensed the way the force is wrong. So you switch to the now empty cartons, basically. So this is the one type of the structure, which is the conditions, and which is hard to know in advance before you executing. So what we have to do is reasoning about things while executing. That is also very important things in the robotics. Here is the hierarchical structure task. So pouring water into a glasses. And it can be consist of a multiple subtasks like pick water, pour water, or place water. And this pick water is actually can be composed of the different movement skills. Go to the near to the water, and then now go to the really grasping position. And then now gripper is closed. And this behavior is shown by the human demonstration, kinesthetic teaching, kinesthetic teaching way. And then all these things are connected automatically to this uh, symbolic uh, subtasks. And then it can execute. So basically what we want to aiming at tries to deal, handle these hierarchical tasks and with high level reasoning and also low level motion planning together. So here is we try to teach the this cooker right at robots how to make a coffee. And then human just shows the, this, the kinesthetic teaching. And then using the, the its knowledge, it just connects. And then the, the task knowledge is uh, expanding. And after learning, a robot is now able to execute what has been shown to it. So it really combines now the low level motion information now with the high level reasoning. And this motion is not only can be done by the learning from the demonstration, but also we can do with uh, reinforcement learning as well. Or you can combine both machine learning, uh, the learning from the demonstration and also reinforcement learning in order to handle better, uh, more stable grasp and so on. These are very typically done. And in this way, when we say, okay, the robot is the current situation is here, but our goal is now pour water to, into a cup. Then uh, we just use this, uh, some basically planning operators to come up with some soft tasks. And then this uh, uh, planning operator makes basically task planning. And then the, this um, motions planning is uh, coming from the learning from demonstrations or reinforcement learning. Okay, so basically, so here is a basically we know that, okay, in order to go here, then we have to pick up the butter and pour the water and place the water, place butter on the floor, on, on the table. And this behavior, exact trajectory is uh, coming from the other side. And for that, we do the, some also the geometric reasoning uh, using the object center to predicate. And one thing I want to highlight is actually, even it is called the same symbolic subtask, let's say, pick water, pick a butter basically, but it is depending on the previous and also the next action it comes, follows basically. So, uh, even it is in order to, in this uh, illustration, this illustration highlights the different trajectories for the same symbolic subtasks, depending on the previous uh, action ended, basically. If robot end was here, then you go to here, basically. But also this can be happening if I pick up butter in order to just place to somewhere else, or pink butter to pour. They make source of differences where to grasping point, right? So if it is a placing just then you can also play, just pick up like this as well. But if it is a pour, you really have to pick from the side. So this is the one of the experiment 
results we did it so initial situation was here and the goal state is basically pouring water uh, so here is the current uh, subtasks and this subtask consists of uh, this uh, uh, movement skills basically move to and pour to and grasping and such thing is automatically happens. So basically this high level part is coming from the geometry reasoning and planning, task planning, and then the motion planning is coming from the reinforcement learning or learning from the human demonstrations. So I think that's all for my talk actually. So I would like to summarize what I talked about today. So I tried to give, explain what kind of challenges we have in the robot of motor skill learning. And first thing I said was uh, robot learning from human demonstration. So skill transfer from human to the robot. And it is a very promising way towards intuitive programming and also efficient motor skill learning. And for the robotics, reinforcement learning is a lot about the sample efficiency in robotics and also safe, basically, exploration, safe learning. And then also deal with the physical world. So this uh, how much really human intervention is needed or not. So this can be achieved, sample efficient and safe reinforcement learning can be achieved by the leveraging, the imitation learning, and also the approximate modern analysis and also learning a lot in the simulation, basically. And going towards to the human robot interaction task or collaboration task, understanding human behavior is very important. And understanding human behavior, there are typical behaviors of the humans, and it can be learned. And also their uncertainties can be learned. And these things can lead to the smooth interaction. And this uncertainty can make robots controller parameters also changing. So robot and behavior is smooth and also very adaptive to the human. And the last point is in order to learn the some complex robotic manipulation tasks, requires multiple objects and so on, we need to understand what is the embedded structure of the dead task. Is it really sequencing or is it really uh, some temporal, temporal or spatial constraints? Is there something in a condition on, the, on some special sensory data or is it about the hierarchical abstractions? And I would like to conclude basically my talk uh, with some overview as well. And then I wanted to say that robot motor skill is actually not only about the learning uh, about some perception. It's not only about the learning about uh, some uh, reasoning mechanism. It's not only about the control. It often it is about the integrated architecture covering symbolic grounding from the sensing data. And this sensing data and symbolic reasoning and task planning, motion planning, and adaptive control in the physical world. And these are all goes together. And then we shouldn't try to deal with this obvious, right? I mean, everybody knows that robotics is about the perception and reasoning and execution, but it doesn't, it shouldn't be one after the other. Often I feel these things has to be really much more tightly integrated in order to make a more fluent robot skill uh, learning basically. So one of the future works of which I think people are, of course, starting looking into it, but it's about understanding what is the differences between the robot learning and, and, and theoretical machine learning approaches. So there are very different challenges are there, very different backgrounds are there. So although there are, we deal with a lot of uh, data in the deep learning nowadays and so on, but the robot also has a lot of data usually, but often we deal with large amount of information from large variety of sensors. 
but or sometimes we have very low number of data as well. So we cannot only deal with uh, many, 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 many data. So often we want to learn very efficiently because of the hardware limitation, because of the cost and so on. And simulator helps to get, of course, more data, but of course it, it often, there are some uh, gap between the reality and that also simulation, but it helps. But basically what is important to look into it as robots, continual learning for the wide range of the sensory data. I think this is the one of the important research directions. And another thing is about uh, some social interaction in the robot learning control, I believe. So robots are active, artificial, you know, is a system, it's an active system. It's not about only work with uh, uh, some data set on the web. We can, robot can influence the data actually, right? So reinforcement learning is also in the, in the sense similar, right? Reinforcement learning, robot agent acts in the real world or in the simulation world in the environment and decides where to go, where to explore. And this, uh, Deciding where to visit is very important. And the robot is also the same. Robot is very active uh, agent. So we can influence the quality of the data. And also we can interact with the human users. And this uh, interactive, intelligent interaction with the human users can influence the, basically the quality and nature of the collections of the data. So we should uh, look more into the, this active learning with multimodal social interaction aspects. So I think these are the, the, my messages about uh, the, yeah, my talk. And I would say, yeah, thank you for your attention. And then there are also some collaboration names uh, I used uh, for my talk today, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, so, so we actually have uh, one question from uh, Kai. So Kai says, thanks for the talk. Most examples you gave rely on collections of different kinds of model primitives. Which approaches are used to smoothly transition from one primitive to the next? Okay. Uh, the, there are many approaches actually, how to um, transit from one primitives to the other primitives. One of the simplistic approach is uh, 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 using the, some dynamical systems basically, uh, because we cannot just generate any this continuous movement to the robot. So we always ensure that the smoothness of the motions. So if you encoded any, let's say, um, dynamical systems, which can make a smooth transition, it would work. It would work, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Bar, uh, who says, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering about the social interaction aspects. How can we apply evolutionary approaches or demonstration slash imitation learning in dialogue? Yes, I think dialogue is a very important thing also, which I would like to look into the, in, in the future, yeah. Uh, basically, I think dialogue is a very important because it just, I think in, in a way that it is important because it is a, a natural way for the human to, to communicate. I mean, I think it's kind of more interpretable and then humans uh, dialogue can be uh, connected to the basically your desired goal, that could be a very 
a nice, and then this dialogue can use, I mean, there are different ways of basically using this uh, social interaction, how I'm going to get in that data, right? You can either show it with uh, whatever visualization, whatever feedback, it can be visualization using uh, GUI, or it can be dialogue. I think these are the, um, yeah, the typical approaches people use. So robot tries to show the basically its uh, current state to the humans. And also humans should also show that to the robot. So, so they are between the more transparency between the two uh, human and robots is gonna be helpful very much. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so we actually have a question by Emmanuel. Emmanuel, can you can you ask your question? Yes, thanks, Sebastian. So we, we just apparently discovered that organizers cannot actually ask questions in the Q and A. So I'm asking my question orally. <laughs> um, I actually have two, um, and one of them is pretty much a follow up on what Kai has been asking just before. Um, I generally really like chatting with, with uh, robotic researchers because they kind of challenge the way I see reinforcement learning. And okay, it, it's basically uh, hierarchical decompositions or temporal abstractions, they're often uh, predetermined, they're pro often provided to, to the, the learning agent. Uh, and when they're not, they're pretty difficult to, to learn. And, and for example, skill chaining uh, in the past seemed like a really promising way to automatically discover skills, discover temporal abstractions. Option critic, for example, also was kind of an advance in that direction. But those automatic discovery um, processes do not really link the learned skills to symbolic representations of the goal, which is pretty much what humans do when you give demonstration about a subtask or a subskill. And so I'm, I'm wondering what, what's your, what would be your insight on um, how, how it would be possible to connect human demonstrations to um, symbolic goals or symbolic um, behaviors and, and the other way around, how do we connect automatically discovered skills to what a human could demonstrate and how could there be human demonstrations in that? Sorry, the question is pretty long, just wanted to try to make it precise. Yes, I think this is a very much uh, interesting topic and then where we are looking into it nowadays actually. So often robot learning people do not necessarily connect this to the symbolic reasoning and so on. So maybe just to look at into the more my previous really long time ago, I just look at into the probability, how probable I'm gonna transit from skill A to the B and so on. But I think nowadays what I'm looking into is a more understanding current context and then tries to uh, basically use it as a kind of uh, basically what are the current state, right? In a symbolic manner, like here in this uh, example. And then Gold also tries to say, okay, now a human is saying, okay, please make a dinner. Then I just assume that what would be the Gold state. And then using the planning operator can generate this in between. And then we know that peak requires, it is connected to the what kind of movement primitives we learned using the real data. So it really tries to link from the high level symbolic reasoning to the low level controller. So that is what we are doing it, what we are trying to do it. I don't know, did I answer your questions? That, that was an open question anyway. So yeah. I get any answer actually open to discussion afterwards, but thanks very much for sharing that. Seb, I actually had a second question. May I ask it too? I can, I can give the floor back. No, 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 go ahead, uh, Emmanuel. So I, I, I'm often, well, I often see myself as a more theoretical reinforcement learning researcher. And, and so this is also one of the things where I like to be challenged. Um, I've always wondered, um, imitation learning in robotics has always be, been, uh, at least uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's kind of always been seen as a way to bootstrap learning for a reinforcement learning agent. 
And I, I'm, I'm sort of questioning that assumption. Is there an assessment somewhere of negative transfer in imitation learning? Uh, like, can one really guarantee that providing human demonstrations will actually provide an advantage in terms of policy learning? Because in the end, that's a transfer learning problem. And transferring uh, functions, especially when you transfer to neural networks, is a very counterintuitive situation in, in lots of situations. So maybe conversely, I can ask the question differently. Is there a work, worst case that we could identify, maybe in robotics, where the de demonstration is actually detrimental to learning? Ha has this been studied from the robotics point of view? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't. I think this is very interesting to hear that uh, other uh, possible, you know, <laughs> results or you know, question, you know, your question about this. It is very interesting. Actually, I didn't see any uh, work saying that learning from the demonstration, learning from the human skills makes worse robots learn. Actually, that probably not seen it. Only thing is uh, some people work on as learning also from the failure cases that is also working. So you use the basically successful demonstrations and also failure demonstration. And the result usually shows that if you use the failure cases also, then even it bootstraps the learning. So that is the typical, uh, yeah, studies. Uh, and then the, uh, I, I don't know. I don't think there was work on this. And I do not doubt about it, of course. Um, of course, it is a transfer learning from the human to the robot. And there are always, we have to deal with the differences. That is always the question, of course. And if maybe that difference is a too much gap existing, maybe it doesn't help that quickly, but so far I didn't see it. I mean, do you have, I mean, this is very interesting discussion. So do you have uh, any reasons why you think this will be, you know, dismantle the learning procedure? Just that it, when, when generally when you try to do transfer learning, like for example, you you learn a neural network for to control a specific task, and then just try to transfer that neural network as a starting point for learning another task, uh, which is more or less close in the distance between tasks, is kind of an open question still. Even though we have metrics to measure that, it it well actually yes. transferring weights in a neural network does not necessarily kickstart the learning so maybe it actually always happens in robotics which would point to the fact that there is some structure there is something uh, that really helps but in in the most general case when you try to transfer it, a, a neural network as a policy from one task to the other um, there is no guarantee that positive transfer always occurs and i'm not saying mm -hmm. that it doesn't occur in robotics I'm just wondering, is there like some specific insight um, that could guarantee that demonstrations from humans are actually always useful and demonstrations are a way to do transfer in a way. So, so that, that's just why I was sort of questioning the assumption. Uh, mm -hmm. But really to me, that's an open question too. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, of course, uh, learning the multiple tasks in a one particular model parameters, it is challenging, I think. Then you might also lose some, uh, aspects what is important for that, that particular task. So I think important thing is also decomposition is important, actually. So you need to have uh, some smaller skills and they can be easily transferred to the higher level things, right? So if a lot of motions are move A to B, close, very simple primitives are very important and, and that has to be really generalizable to the different situations. It has to be generalized to the different location. It has to be generalizable for the what is coming next. I think that is the, uh, yeah, one of, uh, I think I would see it and then try to see that so that we using this uh, task parameters 
so that using these task parameters so that it can be more generalizable to the different situation. I don't know. I think this is also going to the some point you mentioned in the uh, maybe it can be some of ends. I don't know my my thoughts according to the sum of points you mentioned. 